Good morning, it's Juliana. Good morning, Juliana. Good morning, Ricardo. Good to hear your voice this morning. The same for you, the same for, for me to you. <laughs> and, Excellent. And how are you doing okay? All is well? Ah, uh, yeah, it's a little strange here today. I'm I'm at my dad's this week and it is a full on snowstorm here in Medicine Hat. Oh wow wow. Okay. Yeah. No. <laughs> so we are opposite now here is it's getting warmer. And and uh, uh, Suzanne is is joining. Suzanne, are you are you are you there? Yeah. I'm here. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, Suzanne. Uh, uh, welcome. Okay. I would like you to to meet uh, Juliana Barabas. Uh, uh, she is with the uh, International Qualitative Research Toolkit at, at UBC Okanagan okay. Campus. She's our partner in this series. Uh, uh, Juliana, uh, Suzanne, uh, Susanna Frieser, Dr. Fries is here. So Hi. lovely to meet you and thank you yeah. so much for participating. Well, yeah. So if that's a chance to, you know, talk about uh, things. Well, I have just written this chapter on this topic. It's not published yet, but um, um, yeah. So I had something to talk about. And then once the <laughs> intercoder inter agreement uh, uh, update is there in Atlas, we can do another presentation on on that. But I really do want to wait for for the update that that has been planned now for a while, and it's going to be so much better than what we, you know, this is the first implementation. It's always a further development. So so once that is out and released, then we can do another presentation on that. Okay. Okay. Uh, Suzanne, so the, the idea yeah. is that, um, well, you know the system already, but if you could talk around 40 minutes or so, and then leave the remaining for questions and answers, and um, um, people will be writing their questions as you are speaking, and, and I will be uh, then at the end of your presentation, I will read them out loud for you, but you also have access to those questions, so you will be able to answer them as well. Okay. Yeah. And, uh, and normally, I ask people if they would like to speak, and if they do, uh, I offer them the microphone. Okay. Yeah. And and yeah. Um, I let you moderate. Yeah. There. Yeah. So um, you, so uh, it seems to me that I do not have to make you the presenter, right? Because you can do that yourself. Is that correct? Uh, I am organized. I mean, I'm. Uh, so let's see. I. You are uh, organized. Make not another not. attendee. The I'm in a view in uh, sharing. I can. No, you have to make me the presenter. I cannot share my screen. Perfect. So would you like us to to check that now, so I can I, make you the presenter and you uh, and you show uh, just. The, First, uh, yeah. so, uh, I think I, th I think what I think I can do it myself. I think and I can make Atlas Germany. That I think that's me. <laughs> yeah, that's you. That that the presenter. So I can do it myself. Yeah. Okay. Um, you can, okay. Now, um, I, I, now, I can uh, let me just practice and then I get uh, give it back to you. Yeah. Oh, sure. then then you can take it back. Show my screen. Yeah. And. Uh, then you see my presentation, yeah. Yeah, so um, let so, me see. Perfect. And now, you, and now you can take it back. So do you have a, a, a last slide with your contact information that you can show um, for, for uh, people? I can just put it now on it, but just to make yourself the presenter, so I'll just add that at the yeah. last Okay, slide. so I will do that. I will now be the uh, presenter. And um, so what I'd like to ask you is that once you're finished, uh, stay with the last slide, okay, there, so that people can can write, um, uh, yeah. can, you know, can contact you if necessary. Uh, okay, so uh, we are going to wait a little bit. Uh, uh, Juliana, would you like to, to, to say anything about how we should proceed? I mean, we can do it as we did the last time. I say a few words introducing, then uh, uh, you have uh, Suzanne's bio. Uh, uh, I do. Julian. Okay, so then I will give it to you, right? You can introduce Suzanne, then the presenter, 
and at the end, uh, the same as last time, uh, uh, Juliana, you can say a few words at the, about the activities of the of, of the institute. Okay. Sounds great. Yes, thank okay. you. So we have ten minutes now, so to, to with a little bit less, I'm gonna mute myself. Okay, and uh, we start right on time. All right. Wonderful. Thank you, Ricardo. Thank you, okay. Susanna. Thank you. And Dr. Fr is it Dr. Fries or Frise? And uh, it's, it's Frise, if you Frise. want. To. Frise, yeah. Frise, very good. Was yeah, I close? That sounds, yeah, that was, sounds good, yeah. Good, good. So I'm Thank used you. to all variations of the word. <laughs> but, yeah, Believe me, with, with Barabbas, it's the same. <laughs> so, yes. Thank you. And can I check as well? Is it Gotengen, Germany? Uh, say it again. I didn't get that. Is it Gotengen or Gotengen, Germany? And I must not be no. pronouncing it even closely. <laughs> no, no. Because what? Which? What is the context? Uh, this the where Max Planck Institute for oh, the study good. of religion. Okay. That's Göttingen. 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 Okay. Very Göttingen. Good. Yeah. That. Okay. And, uh, and but I am currently well, well not since almost, almost. I mean, I live in in uh, the Netherlands. Ah, I see. Do so you want me to I'm, update your bio to that, or shall I just keep it as the? Well, I I still I'm a research. Well, that's the uh, that's what what's in the bio that I am. Um, research partner of the Max Planck Institute. So if I'm writing academic articles, then that's my kind of academic home because otherwise I'm a consultant with Quark. Yeah, that's my company. But yes. uh, that's, yeah. But uh, so if I, because I'm still writing academic articles, so that's what I do via the Max Planck. And that's ah. in Germany. Yeah, but we had, I had been working there for four years on a, on a project. And then when I left, I'd ask them whether we can keep that academic connection. So, Susanne, yeah. uh, should I introduce you as Atlas DI or as Max Planck or as Quark? No, as Atlas. From uh, yeah. yeah, and then I, you know, my academic side is the Max Planck. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, so for the stuff I'm writing. Yeah. Which so you know that what the presentation is also that academic part of me. Yeah. <laughs> The way it is now, it's okay. 
on the screen on the slide yeah 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 okay so we have three more minutes it's like an airplane it will depart right on time okay <laughs> perfect okay Welcome everyone. Welcome to the new series Explorations in Atlas TI, a partnership between Atlas TI, the International Qualitative Research Toolkit at the University of British Columbia, Okanagan Campus, and the Inquiry Methodology at the School of Education at Indiana University. Uh, today we are going to be presenting uh, role and impact of CACTAS for Design and Qualitative Research uh, by Dr. Susanne Friese, Product Specialist at Atlas TI Scientific Software Development GmbH. I'm Ricardo Contreras with Atlas TI, and I will give you a few introductory words. And I'm here uh, with my colleague, Juliana Barabas from the International Qualitative Research Toolkit at UBC, Okanagan Campus. Um, so, a few words before we, we start the presentation. Um, uh, Dr. Friese will be speaking for around 40 minutes. While she's speaking, uh, please feel free to write down your questions in the questions section of the GoToWebinar control panel. Now, you can take a look at that panel now, and you can write a few words, maybe say hi, and I will be able to see that. Okay, so you go ahead and write your questions, and at the end of her presentation, uh, uh, she is going to proceed to answer them. And I will uh, offer the microphone to those who want to speak. Uh, this presentation is being recorded, and uh, you are going to receive the video recording of it in about three hours at the, after the end of it. Um, now, at this time, I would like to uh, ask my colleague Juliana Barabas uh, to say a few words introducing our presenter. Thank you so much, Ricardo and Dr. Friese, for your participation in this series today. Dr. Suzanne Friese started working with computer software for qualitative data analysis in 1992. Her initial contact with Cactus Tools was from 1992 to 94, as she was employed at Qualys Research in the USA. In following years, she worked with the Cactus Project in England, 94 to 96, where she taught classes 
on the Ethnograph and Nudist, which is known today as InVivo. Two additional software programs, MaxQDA and Atlas TI, followed shortly. Suzanne has accompanied numerous projects around the world in a consulting capacity, authored didactic materials, and is the author to the Atlas TI user's manual, sample projects, and other documentations. The third edition of her book, Qualitative Data Analysis with Atlas TI, was published in early 2019 with Sage Publications. Suzanne's academic home is the Max Planck Institute for the Study of Religious and Ethnic Diversity in Göttingen, Germany, where she pursues her methodological interest, especially regarding qualitative methods and computer-assisted qualitative data analysis. Please help me in welcoming Dr. Suzanne Frise. Thank you very much, um, Juliana. Now, Suzanne, it's all yours. Okay. So I'm just uh, waiting for the next screen. It says so now. <clears throat> I think you should be able to see my uh, screen now. We do see your screen now. And, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. It's yeah, um, thanks for the uh, introductory words. This presentation is based on a book chapter I have been writing for a new Sage handbook on research design. And I was asked to write something about yeah, the role and impact of Cactus software. The book chapter is a bit more general, not so focused on Atlas, but um, here this presentation, I make it more about Atlas. <clears throat> The, um, oh, <laughs> that was an interesting uh, spell check correction. The mythological fit, it should be the mythological fit. Um, uh, the, I let the spell check run through, but I didn't check that. So it's about the research gold and mythological fit that you first actually have to um, look at when when you start yeah, thinking about research design and, <clears throat> and cactus. So what are these programs good for? So uh, um, yeah, or QDAS is, uh, I think it's, a, yeah, the CACDAS is a longer abbreviation because it's computers. This is called safe data analysis software. And I think QDAS is, uh, yeah, it goes a bit easier over the lips. So QDAS is uh, great for segmenting and sorting data. And when it comes to compare and contrasting shared topics across data and looking for relationships. And because, Basically, what you need to do in, in QDAS is code your data. I mean, there are some other functions around it, but kind of the core and the heart of it is, is really to code the data material. If your aim is something different from as Aga he wrote in uh, 1991, if figuring out the problem is the main goal, well, then sometimes, and I think that, that I uh, just read the last part of it. For that, you need a little bit of data and a lot of right brain. And he uses a very nice picture when you read that chapter. And I have the references uh, uh, for that uh, article. It's basically one of the first books on uh, computer system analysis. And there's some beautiful articles in it. And I can only invite you to go and look at at that old stuff, so to speak. Um, but it's it's very, very valuable. A lot of people don't know this um, any anymore. Um, <clears throat> And what he actually says is something he likes to sit in a lecture room and with lots of boards around him and where he makes lots of notes and then sits in the middle of it and really wants to sit in the middle of the data. So now we, of course, we are 30 something years or 30 years, not actually 30 years later, and maybe we have technology uh, for that, but it's, that's not really what uh, Curious is all about. But I was thinking about that was actually something that was also a project for data visualization at the Max Planck Institute, which is a datorama. So actually, we, uh, that would be an example where you can sit in the middle of your data and look around you if you have astrographic data, and then you can also click and do look for maps and maybe even let the audio for your interviews play and stuff like that. So there is some technology actually these days where you can sit in the middle of your data and use a lot of your right brain to really maybe first figure out what is the research question. So for that, you know, we don't really, um, maybe don't need um, <clears throat> a cue just yet, but when you decide, okay, this, I have a coding approach in my, for my 
research design and um, I th thought about my objective and <clears throat> and also about my methodological approach and that suits the use of uh, uh, software like, like Atlas or Max Rea or Invivo or Deduce or whatever there is out there. Of course, there are also differences in these um, programs out there. So here we see Atlas and and uh, a lot of this, the basic functionality and coding and retrieving your data is essentially the same across these different software packages. Yeah, the the, the next screenshot is on Quercus. There you see the the that they're coding a bit on a on a map and the the margin area, what Atlas calls the margin area, is, is somewhere in the middle. So sometimes it's these this user interfaces that are different, and I I always yeah invite people to just uh, try it out. So this is the uh, the Atlas Cloud version, which also, again, looks a bit different. And you have to look at also what are your needs, again, linking it back to the research design of what you want to do. If you want to code in a team, for example, at the same time, developing your code system, um, and may also maybe with a team that sits uh, across you know different location the cloud version is a wonderful tool because you can do that you can really code at the same time which you cannot do with any of the desktop versions it's um it's it's always a, a process then of of having sub project and merging things together so that also goes back to the question what are my objective what do i want to do um what is the best software choice for that and yeah I am talking, of course, from the Atlas perspective, but in a new, from a more neutral point of view, there is not the best choice out there. There is, yeah, there's always a question that, of course, I ask, you know, can you recommend the best software that is out there? That's a bit like, you know, what is the best car? Well, it's also a matter of taste and and how how that feels for you, and of course, for purpose. Do I need a big station wagon um, if I'm single? Uh, yeah, maybe if I'm interested in surfing and that kind of stuff. But if I don't have a family, if I'm on my own, well, I need a small car. Yeah, and I don't need that. So there's is a bit of that. But of course, that's not about software choice here. But it's 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 um, the methodological choice and your attention objective that can influence also the type of software you are looking for. And we, I talk a bit um, more about that also a bit later when it well, when we're talking about coding. So the question also I was asked when writing the chap chapter, how software changes the way do you design your project? Well, one thing is you need to think about preparing the data in a form that can, the computer can read it. And you may consider other data sources that you might not consider if you actually do a manual analysis. Um, you might have some ideas about how you can organize team projects differently because you have the software. We have cloud versions where you can uh, work better in a team, but don't make software a dogma. You really have to think also at some phenomenological approaches where you have to do a lot of thinking and a lot of writing on very small bits and pieces of your data. Do you need a CUDA then? Yeah. Is it a bit over the top? Of course, knowing a program already, you can say, well, you know, I don't have the learning curve. I also, you know, use this program with a little bit of data and lots of thinking because I'm using the comments and memo functions and I have it all digital and not, you know, somewhere on paper or, you know, in, uh, in different uh, documents in Word or whatever. Yeah? So there's always a question, do I already know a program? Then, of course, you might also already use it if you even have just a little bit of data. <clears throat> but let me just do a little thought experiment so you, you all can start thinking about how it was different preparing a research article or a book chapter um, before you actually before there actually was word. So I'm thinking more about authors like Max Weber, Duvet. Um, yeah, that is all a while back, and if you start reading the articles from back then, well, you can see they couldn't do cut and paste. Yeah, they they had they wrote it on paper, and maybe there was some correction there, but then they probably give it you know gave it to somebody, um, or you know it was still all all handwritten. So that was a very different way of actually working. 
and yeah when i was faced with that question it was like well i have done one study manually i started in 1992 using software so my master's thesis my data for my master's thesis before i did um yeah it's all on paper basically and you know what whatever you you can do then and then a few years later i had a small interview study where i thought well i can do that quickly on paper and then i was getting frustrated because i couldn't find anything something i had marked you know right on the you know with a red marker on the top right and i knew that but i couldn't find it again so it lots lots of searching and this click in the software if you do that right away with the software so it's a bit of a difficult question to ask me that you know how software changes the way you design a project because i would always integrate that from the very beginning i would not even consider not using it apart from that what I said at the beginning, maybe you should first figure, need to figure out the problem. Um, that's kind of the fourth stage, uh, before research stage, before you start um, then the next step. And <clears throat> then when using software, well, it already all starts with why well, you can organize data in multiple ways, in, 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 in different ways by organizing it you couldn't do that really with stacks of uh, paper on the floor if you have all your documents there or if you have have yeah you needed to photocopy stuff and I'm, I'm just kind of kind of always going back to like how would it be without software how what would you actually do well even if you would use word yeah it, uh, um yeah then there are so many different ways that what we can do and that's why i would it's very difficult to, for me to imagine to plan a project um, without even considering that software might be a good choice. And the same with what we can do when we write today in Word as compared to previous ways of writing an article is we, we can approach it much more exploratory. Yeah, You all have been writing papers, I, I suppose. Yeah, we, if we write something and we know we can cut and paste and we can move it around in the Word document and we have an idea about the chapter structure, but you know, things move around and you can insert things. And the same happens uh, with coding if you use software, it's much more flexible. However, there is also, of course, differences that we need to consider. Yeah, so if you use software, the coding system needs to be built in a different way that works differently at, as compared to not using software. The purpose of Cactus um, is to organize the data so you can retrieve and find things. Again, what I said before, if you do manually, well, you just go crazy with trying to find something again. And, <clears throat> and in order for the software to, or that you're able to retrieve and analyze the data, the data needs to be organized in a particular way. And that is something that comes with software using it really starts already um, when when you start setting up a project and and uh, yeah preparing your, your data. So that is these are the things that you really have to think through from the very beginning. So the important task for the reach researcher then is um, to translate those methodological steps. So that's what's written in the books because oftentimes it doesn't tell you how you do that in software and all the things that you need to consider. So you need to have to do that translation act and um, to see you know, how certain things that are described in the literature, how that translates into mouse clicks in computer software. And that's more the challenge I see. And that's what I want to share uh, with you and it's for certain things seem trivial it's trivial but uh, these are things I often see uh, not done or you know people figure it out maybe after they yeah, have done uh, or done with the project said oh I could have done that better yeah so uh, if you but, uh, consider your research project more like an excursion into unknown territory and then the material is the terrain that you are studying and the analytical approach is the pathway through. So really, like, that is kind of also, yeah, 
dictating maybe is a strong word, but it's 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 kind of leading the way also through the software, which and how you use the different functions in the software. So it really also starts with your methodological approach. Often, if I have people in a in a class also learning the software, do you know what how you want to analyze your data? Uh, people most of the time don't know, and yet, or they have some vague idea, but doing a discourse analysis or phenomenological analysis or uh, thematic analysis, uh, ground theory analysis will kind of show you a different pathway through the software and the software tools are your equipment through it. And then you're gonna use tools also differently within the software, depending on the methodological approach you have chosen to begin with. Another thing you should, or I invite you, to consider from the very beginning is, do I want to make my data available for later reuse? Yeah, I've, I've listed here some archives, and <clears throat> uh, that's not, yeah, I'm just thinking, and there's a, a PIP reference, which I forgot to put in the reference section in the end, but uh, if we make the um, presentation available, I can, I can add that um, uh, to it. Because what, why it's important to consider it now, because you need to ask your participants uh, whether they approve of that, whether they approve for you to add the data to a data archive. And these archives, they can do actually nice things. They can actually um, uh, say, well, these data can only be made available in 100 years time or 50 years time. So if people don't want their data to be reanalyzed or used by others in their lifetime, well, they should be an option then in your um, you know, confidentiality agreement and the type of agreements you, you make with your participants at, yeah, that they could actually say, well, there you can reuse, reuse the data or upload them to an archive, but you know, in 50 years time. And you need to ask it, if, yeah, consider that in the, in the research design phase. And so you can later uh, do that. And I think it's, it will be very nice uh, for people in the future to also look at data that are collected now and, and compare them. Maybe something that's what's happening in 50 years time. So some more about uh, data preparation. It's not really so much talk about RTF, doc, doc, X, HTML. Most of the programs can handle those uh, kind of uh, files. But for example, what I see a lot in that, that comes uh, in the, uh, um, this transcription, people have tables, they transcribe these tables and they have line numberings in their tables or they have two columns. That's all very not ideal for how software across the board, not only Atlas handles it. So it's a plain file without tables that's the easiest to handle and the software does the paragraph numbering for you yeah and some even do line numbering and I think but the line numbering that really comes from that old age where we you know before 1990 before we didn't have software and people would still want to do line numbering because they want to refer back to um, you know line number 10 whatever it's the, in the digital age it's a paragraph numbering but that is something that the software does for you and if you know that already then you don't have to prepare your word documents with line or paragraph numbering the same with pdf files what we see also uh, a lot that uh, not a lot but it happens that um, yeah, people have graphic PDFs. We just actually just recently had a case where somebody wanted to do intercode agreement analysis, had PDF documents, but these were not text PDF documents, and Atlas cannot do image uh, intercode agreement analysis for image files. So these are things that are important to also know and to uh, figure out when you set up a project. How are these? What do I want to do? <laughs> And uh, can I do that with the material I have? Same with video file format, um, image image files, what's supported, how do I prepare it? So don't have all your video recorded things done and then you figure out uh, that format doesn't really work with the software uh, that well because the files are too big or um, those kind of issues that uh, I would always with those files would prepare a small one minute file, check it out, does it work well with the software and then prepare all of the other data. 
then you have to check its transcription is supported and how is it supported or do I want to uh, trans using another um, external transcription software and now these days with uh, Teams and um, Zoom we get these automated transcripts or with these auto uh, uh, mated transcript services that are provided these all come with VTT and SRT format can I import those transcripts in the software? And if not, are there some workarounds and how do I get it in there? So all of these things need to be considered also at the research design phase when you think about, you know, how do I want to prepare um, my data? It's also issues regarded to file size and, and document links. Now this, so programs can, often not uh, handle very large documents uh, that easily because, well, if you have a 500 page document that needs to be loaded, it takes some time. And also if you only retrieve like certain parts of the document from what is coded in your document, what are quotations in Atlas, in order to retrieve those quotations, the document behind it also needs to be loaded. If I have a 500 page PDF document and I only need a certain section out of it, do I add that whole document to Atlas or do I uh, kick out all the 230 pages I don't need and then I, the document is only half the size. Uh, the same also with size I sometimes see with, it, with, with images. Of course we can make very high resolution images also with our phones these days but our screen has a lot, uh, yeah if it has a 3000 400 whatever resolution that's already very high um, so sometimes we have 4, 4k monitors but a lot of monitors are having a lower resolution so if you put in a, a photo with a very high resolution it only needs to be rendered down that takes time that takes effort computer power and that's not necessary so you can you can just upload the, the data in the quality that you need and um, and that can be represented well on the screen. The same with terms of file size is with videos. If I have a two hour uh, long video, is it, yeah, can I split that maybe in shorter 20 minute videos? Because that's also a bit easier uh, on the computer. If you work with video, you should have a high powered computer, but also there it might be easier also to have shorter videos also in terms of displaying it with the uh, with the coding you know it's 20 minutes are easier to handle than a very very long video file and there's probably certain sections that help you to divide that file and and within the functionality of the software you can always group everything that kind of belongs uh, together if your two hour is two hours is actually one session but you have multiple files for that so all of that can always be handled um, by software. Then the other point here is um, embedded images makes it sometimes difficult to load if it's a Word document. Saving that as PDF makes it oftentimes a lot, of, lot, uh, a lot quicker. So these things can already be optimized when you start preparing your data files for use in software. Now about uh, transcription. What you see is my recommendation. I would always recommend to have an, an empty line between speakers in order to use autocoding. If you also want to autocode your speaker units, these the speakers need to be unique. Yeah, if I have used RL for Alexander, then it should always be RL and colon and not one time A and then other time uh, Alexander and then another time I forgot the colon. That is for a computer, that computers are very consistent. If you then auto code and look for the letter A, L and the colon as sign, the computer is very consistent in finding that. If you have been consistent, inconsistent transcribing, then you miss out on some speaker units. So these things also need to be considered. Also, if you don't transcribe yourself, if you give it to somebody else, that they actually um, know what, uh, what you want. Also, I've recently um, come across a focus group, but the transcription that I did was horribly transcribed. 
but um, I guess there was also maybe some some uh, instructions missing. I think it looked to me like it started out with some tables and then there was some reformatting done. Yeah, so knowing that that tables well, might not be so, such a good thing um, for for yeah um, programs not only Atlas thing also across the board uh, that you can instruct the person who transcribes the data and in that focus group all it was only the, the the moderator and the speakers there was no differentiation between the speakers sometimes that's of course difficult to to, to distinguish between the voices but i think um yeah again also it depends on the audio quality and you do you want these different speakers to be differentiated then that should be also considered uh in the in the research design that the order equipment uh, is accordingly that um, you have different audio uh, yeah different microphones wants to record every speaker then it's also easier to transcribe because in the analysis I found it's like was that now the same person speaking uh, yeah you couldn't sometimes guess and see why that seemed to be an opinion of that same person but for the analysis it can be uh, it makes a difference whether uh, different statements throughout the focus group are from the same person or from different persons and in with that transcript there's no way um, of knowing that yeah so that is also something you need to be clear of from the beginning do i want that it doesn't it really doesn't it matter it might not matter in certain circumstances but um that is if you haven't considered that from the very beginning then you, have, you get stuck with uh, what comes out in the, the in the end and yeah then you also if you have data from excel normally the excel import is uh, for survey data open-ended questions but you can also use that for other type of structured data and um, i think a lot of programs these days offer some excel import but of course that doesn't work by the normal and document function it works uh, it's some other import function and and then you also need to know how to prepare those data so this is how you prepare those data in atlas so that what you see on the right hand side of the screen so that um, it turns out like this so atlas automatically can pre-code all the questions and add the social demographic characteristics uh, through the groups uh, through the documents and that is all already prepared before you start using the software and again it all has to do with how do i collect my data how do um how how do i get them that in excel from ever from the other program i'm i'm using to collect your data and how do i get that in and the procedure for that is different for different packages but kind of the idea is similar to what you see here on the screen so that uh, a lot of structured information that is already there that comes from the excel data that can it's automated and you don't have to do that uh, manually and also this literature review yeah uh, it's just also yeah you sometimes don't uh it's not in my chapter i didn't think about that but i just um again if you see users um like you know asking about literature review and then they just added their pdf documents as normal documents and said yeah but didn't you know about the special import function which also actually helps you to add some metadata that you don't have to do that manually so sometimes yeah it's not so um, obvious that, that there are these different ways of adding documents to the software and that's why I just showing and said I add this here uh, to kind of say yeah also um, that can if you already use the software anyway and have decided on the software the whole first bit can of course also be done by the software and you do your whole literature review in order maybe to even come to find out how you want to design your project so that would be even a step um yeah before you really decide what method you want to use and how you want to uh, design your project so you can also use that already to do your literature review um, in, in Atlas and other programs. Next step is how do you name your data file? Yeah, if you look at the left hand side and if you look at the right hand side of my screen, 
I think you can see yourself there's a bit of more information on the right hand side. And I see it's, I guess, 90% of the time that documents have names like interview one, two, three, four, or transcript one, two, three, four. You see some date here. It's our data from 2017. So sometimes the date of the trend or the date of the interview is added. Well, is that so important if you don't have like a longitudinal study if, uh, when the interview was conducted? Uh, what I'm always recommending is having a analytical useful data file name. The date might be important, might not be. So what you see is some, some analytic criteria that, that are important that you want to compare. So as an example, you want to compare uh, different company sizes and different um, levels, uh, people from di uh, different levels of employment, maybe gender and maybe age. And if you add that directly, in the document name, you have that information right there, and it helps you also in Atlas to make document groups as well, of course, for later analysis that they those need does that information needs to be turned into groups. But then it's already there, and you don't have to kind of kind of think, oh, transcript uh, for uh, was that a male or female now, and you have to look it up in your Excel table to then prepare the. Uh, the, the groups in Atlas or variables in, in, in attributes and other programs. And the other benefit you have is you have a good analytical file name. If you retrieve your data, and that is the quotation reader in Atlas, then that data file name pops up here. So without having done any comparative analysis, I can immediately, while going through my quotation, I can see where this is coming from, though this is a male with a high school education, that person is married, has children, and is 37 years of age. And then if I go through, I have that additional information there. If I use the generic file name, I'm missing that, and I would have to use your further tools uh, to, to get at that information. So this is what you can already do at the very beginning um, to help later on in the analysis. Um, if you have five minutes of introduction, just a quick question. Do I still have 10 minutes or do I have to have five or six? Ricardo? Oh, yeah, it, it, I think that if you leave at least uh, f uh, 15 minutes for questions and answers, that would be okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so the next, the next thing that um, a lot of people crumble is, yeah, this technical stuff. In terms of product management. Of course, if you work with software, you should need to think about those things. So not just downloading the software and start, and then some, something happens to your computer, and uh, yeah, we've come across that. People have, they don't know how to make a backup, they've never done a backup. They thought Atlas would save the data somewhere in the cloud, and they ask the support team, that, Do you have a copy of my project? Of course, Atlas doesn't have a copy of the project, would also have like a lot of data security issues involved in that. But these are the things you come across. And that's why uh, this, that also you, you, you need to think about those things also in the face of the research design. Where do I want to store my data? Um, and I recommend you know do backup after each work session. Have some rolling copies you can always revisit uh, some some part of your uh, project um, so you can kind of follow what you have been doing and also even more important when you work in a team that also should be um, talked about looked at the and also looked at uh, in the manual and maybe looking at some videos how does teamwork work and set up a workflow with your team think about naming conventions of your files how you want to uh, share files how you want to name these files yeah the people having to merge all projects together well if the yeah if there's no naming convention it's a bit of a nightmare for the person so you can you can facilitate that that process a lot um, by thinking those issues through before you start the work and not after um, things have uh, gone wrong this is a phone call i got one day and um 
and that is uh, happens uh, more often also. So I the question was then how do I calculate intercoder reliability? I've coded two interviews. My colleague has coded two interviews. So what are we doing now? And then there's still at this stage a lot of question. How have you set up your project? Uh, was it a coding system? Did you define the codes? Did you? How was that all done? Yeah, and sometimes people just go and code. There is no code system. Everybody kind of does their own thing, and then uh, the assumption is that then you can run intercoder real reliability. I'm not going to talk that much about it because it's actually a, yeah another a, a presentation by itself. But those kind of things need to, um, yeah, you, there are methodological ideas behind it. The, uh, that is um, something also you, you you should be aware of. It's not something you just run in Atlas. You should also kind of think about uh, what coefficients you want, what's behind those coefficients, why do you need it, um, and and then how to set up your project. So for for this um, really to work, there should be a coding system already with definitions uh, before even the second coder goes about coding the data. Uh, just as a little hint, but all of this information is also in, in case of Atlas, we have described it uh, in the manual and there is some references also to learn more about it. But so there is, um, yeah, there's always this combination of knowing methodology and also knowing then the procedures in the software. So when you have your data in the right formats and you sort about good data file names, so I usually recommend to start uh, a project by organizing your data. So here you do have case names in the data file names. It's actually um, my my dissertation from a long time from a long time ago. Um, that was the version four of Atlas 19, whatever, 98. And I have had quantitative data as well. So these case numbers are actually the case numbers from the questionnaire. And um, I might, you know, add some more uh, analytic information to the file name, but just here as an example. So there's females, and there there is their their uh, buying status. So I had done some research on addictive, impulsive, compulsive, addictive buying behavior. Um, so the first step is in organizing your data. So that could be in document groups, and um, <clears throat> That could also be via coding. That's why I have that that um, <clears throat> screenshot here. If you have focus group data, of course, you cannot work with document groups, but you can auto code your speakers. And um, that's you also need to know how that works in the software, how that is done, and how you need to prepare your transcript in order to be able to then let Atlas code the speakers, code the socio demographics of the speakers. And I guess a lot of programs these days can do that, but they all handle it kind of differently so you kind of should know beforehand before you add those data or prepare your focus group data so you can utilize these functionalities in the software so this then allows you actually to compare different speakers or compare um, these are teachers uh, french teachers to spanish teachers and 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 so on yeah but again this needs to be kind of known from the beginning you know once the data is coded and uh, yeah, and the, the, the transcript is not in a way that you can use that autocoding function. You cannot do that then afterwards anymore. So the last point I'm going to talk about is uh, coding. And also here, I think also software choice and methodological choice are important. If you know your methodological approach, what kind of coding is it? Is it inductive? Is it deductive? Is it a mix of both? Yeah, then you thematic coding, certain type of round theory coding, line by line, Gerund coding. Um, that all comes with your methodological choice. And some programs are really, they lead more towards deductive type of coding. They kind of ask you to start with a category and then adding subcodes which I think you can just code that or then, you know, as a workaround, start on the subcode level if you want to code inductively. But programs are different in the way they support coding and type of coding. So that is also then related to methodological choice and software choice if, if you yeah, have the liberty also to make different choices for, 
for different um, projects. And, <clears throat> and then auto coding the data also has, yeah, that works also um, best if you, that's why I gave that, that recommendation for transcription, really have empty lines between either different data units or speaker units because the software then can better pick up what you want to auto code because then you, yeah, then you have clear paragraphs. Um, a paragraph structure and then it's that easier for, for auto coding. And in terms of the, the coding process, here it's really important to understand what coding means in a methodological and in a technical sense. Yeah? Technically, well, you tag data, you assign a label to a data segment. That's all that there is in software and that's all what software knows. Software doesn't know anything about, is it uh, on the descriptive level, is it a concept, is it a subcode, is it a dimension, is it a property? That's all methodological terminology and that's of course all we deal with when we analyze data. We not only want to tag data on kind of the same level, yeah, we have ideas on different level of abstraction and that's what we have to know how we actually do that within the software. So that's where the also the methodological level comes in. So we have different types of codes and we have different levels of abstraction. And yeah, so this is kind of my, my syntax that I've developed over time, how you can differentiate between concept and categories and subcodes um, in Atlas. I don't want to, yeah, don't have time to talk too much about it, but to can say, yeah, we have to tell the software where are, what is a descriptive label, or we have to know that, and what is a category. And that, of course, comes with practice also, and it's also independent of character. So this is a, uh, a quote by Corbin and Strauss. One of the mistakes beginning analysts make is to fail to differentiate between levels of concepts. They don't start early in the analytic process differentiating lower level explanatory concepts from the larger ideas of higher level concepts that seem to unite them. If an anal analysis does not begin to differentiate at this early stage of analysis, he or she is likely to end up with pages and pages of concepts and no idea how to fit this together. So this has been written by Corbin and Strauss who did not, and Corbin, so later on she always recommended for young people to use software, but she hasn't done it herself. So even without software, you can fall into that trap, which has been described in the literature as the coding trap or the code swamp as I um, uh, describe it. So that is more research skills and methodological knowledge. It's not really, um, yeah, it's, e it's much easier even to do that in software, but it's really a methodological skill that you have to bring to the software. And here are just some ideas on how you can translate certain methodological tasks. Task. What we see here is the Sharma's initial and focus coding. And the initial Gerund coding that Sharma describes, I would do by setting quotations, as you can see up here, and not, not, not coding in a kind of tagging kind of sense. And using the quotation names for the Gerund coding, well, she calls it coding, but in Atlas, I would set quotation names. And the focus coding, well, then you can use Atlas codes. So it's not necessarily a code is a code. And same with actual coding. Actual coding, I would not consider coding in Atlas. Yeah, to just um, read the first one, cross-cutting or relating concepts to each other. And yeah, I always see like, yeah, then we did actual coding. Uh, maybe sometimes, but here's just some ideas. Actual coding can happen in writing quotation comments by relating ideas to each other. That's what they did. They in, in the old days, they, they had their memos and then when they related things to each other and in writing memos, and that could be a quotation comment in Atlas, could also be a memo in Atlas, could be then starting to link things in networks. And some, yeah, sometimes it might be, but yeah, I think it's more relating sub subcodes. So we really have to develop subcodes within then you at the at the network level. So, it, but it has nothing to do with tagging. But methodologically, it's called coding. So this is all the yeah that what 
what what we need to also bring when you when we think and how do we actually implement a certain research design in the software. So what often happens then if people, especially if they run into that coding trap, they have 2,000 codes, don't know what to do, uh, then they print everything out to Excel and have their papers on the floor again. So they basically throw out the baby with the bathwater bath or blame the software. Yeah, and and here I can only reiterate, and I think you have maybe come across some of the presentations um, of uh, Christina Silva and um, and and uh, some others also who, who work with that approach. That you really have to think about your attention, which is the strategy, and then think how you can implement that in the software, which is a tactic, and that is their five-level uh, QDA model. And that that's really important to to think about what's my research design, what are the software functionality, and how can I actually uh, implement that. So the last slide here is, um, yeah, so I hope I have shown how like software choice and methodological choice and research design go hand in hand, and that sometimes frustrations do occur because there's either the methodological fit is not there, you, know, you have chosen software and it kind of forces to think more deductively, but you have an inductive approach, it doesn't really work, or you you don't, you need some more experience, you need to first learn with it, um, and you, you're still lacking the skills, maybe need to have some more software, or not software training, but methodological training uh, to build that up, and I can I can assure you that you, of course, learn and improve with every project, and and I hope this the presentation or papers I write, I can give some of the pointers based based on the experience, so that you don't run into some avoidable mistakes or, or learn uh, from those. But I would would say that um, yeah, there are certain yeah I wouldn't call them dangers, but there are you know certain bumps that can occur. There are certain issues that if you're not aware of it, yeah, it makes things a bit more difficult. Uh, but there's no reason to reject software altogether. It's just to kind of learn and uh, over time and improve them with uh, the next project. So here are some references in the um, yeah that that I've used throughout. Here's my contact, but I can um, yeah show that also later on. I think we'll open up for questions, and I can probably go back to some of the slides um, that, that I've been presenting. Now. I've been answering some questions that are, are about Atlas TI. However, uh, there are some that are, I think, uh, questions that you should answer. And, and let's take a look at, at one of them. Uh, you have you have access to those questions, right? Uh, one by Sasha. Uh, would you like me to read it for you, or would yeah. you read it? Yeah, yeah, I think you have the better overview now. For, of that. Okay. So it's uh, thank you for the presentation. Uh, doctor, uh, if you prepare initial codes in a deductive way and follow with inductive codes, new themes start emerging inductively. And she yeah. refers to that as codable moments. Mm -hmm. What is your advice to achieve code saturation using this dualistic approach? I am ending up with so many codes uh, and that is my challenge. Yeah, I think if you have um, a lot of codes, you really have to to review what uh, what you can. Yeah, you have to move to a more abstract level. I, and I think also seeing what the more abstract level is is also a bit of, of of practice to kind of say, well, this and this and this, and I can actually summarize under under a more common a common label. Or it might also be if people cannot cannot get yeah. Uh, they, they are afraid of merging things together. So in Atlas, it would be mean really you have to think about a more higher order term and then merging those codes together to summarize them under a higher order label. And the and I'm always saying you don't have to be afraid of that because it's always going to be in the quotations. You're not losing anything. And in version nine of Atlas also gives you an audit trail of of the codes you have been merging together. So if you have lots and lots of codes, that's the that's the task you need to do. You have to really think of what is a higher order concept, and you really need to merge those codes. And a little tip: sometimes it helps to talk about it. 
because when I talk uh, about it, and maybe you can have that also in purpose if you talk with your colleagues about it and then ask your colleagues, you know, if you hear something, you know, that seems to be a, a bit more abstract, then please point it out to me because oftentimes when I talk to people and listen to them, I can say, well, that's your higher order co uh, concept. So I think you know it, but um, it's that then putting that into yeah practice or in, into a code in Atlas. So oftentimes um, you are aware of it, but you're not quite there in putting it into a code or be afraid of merging stuff. Any other question, Ricardo, you want to? Yes, yes. There is another question from Amir, and Amir is asking, should university methods courses teach uh, QDA concurrently with CACTAS uh, via CACTAS packages? Do you think that might influence methodological designs? Yeah, I, 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 I have done it. You know, I, it's, it's, it's like yeah, I, they could in some some kind of say, well, you have to do the first coding exercise on paper uh, in order to kind of learn how to code, but. You know, you can also learn how to code by just giving people software and say, here, it's a document, start to code. And then, of course, you have to, to look at that coding and discuss it and tell people, you know, this is too descriptive, this is too abstract, here you need to, uh, um, uh, you know, people, these mistakes are, they, they code with a research question, say, well, now listen to what's in the data. You code what's in the data, you research question, you answer those research question based on on, on then what you, yeah, when you retrieve data or run some other analysis in the software. So I think you can also teach people how to code uh, while teaching them software at the same time. Okay, thank you, uh, 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 Suzanne. There is another question from Amir. Uh, and I'm, uh, Amir, if you would like to, to speak, uh, we can offer you the microphone. Uh, in, and if that is the case, uh, could you please uh, raise your hand uh, by clicking on the hand icon next to your name? Yes, so we'll give you the microphone. Okay, so let me unmute you. Go ahead. Now you need to click on the microphone icon next to your name. Go ahead now. Thanks, Ricardo, and uh, thanks, Susanna, for, for this uh, lovely presentation. Um, I, I just had another question that I'm kind of grappling with on analysis of my own data, um, thinking about the poten poten potentials of uh, directly coding audio and, uh, and image and, and video data, um, not necessarily going uh, all the way to transcribing it fully, uh, but rather perhaps uh, doing uh, some kind of gisting alongside the creation of quotations in, in Atlas DI, for example. I've been thinking of the extent to which um, this, these kinds of practices of directly coding uh, multimodal data might um, ultimately influence the way we think about methodological designs that were um, that might have been uh, you know conceived in times when this was not possible so I just wondered if you had any thoughts on that that you would like to share or, or your thoughts in general about uh, direct coding of, um, of well, extra well, with audio data, I would I, th I find it very difficult to code audio data directly because you don't see anything, and with the we, we rather you cannot go by the waveform because it then doesn't mean if you know the voice goes down or the the wave you know is lowering that the sentence is finished. So I find it it takes longer to code uh, audio than if you transcribe and then code the the transcription. This video is different, and um, this video I would I would actually before I sit there hours and hours and, and I've, I've met once a PhD student who has transcribed the video data for a year, 12 months of transcription. And uh, now video data, I would go and code. And because I, you know, it's, you, you see what's there and you can hear, you can see and hear when the sentence uh, is, is finished and it's, 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 um, it's easier, it's easy enough to set the, the quotations, but with, with audio, it, it's, it's time consuming to do that, really catch the, the end of the segment that that you want to actually code, even also if that could be a half sentence as well. Um, and yeah, as I as mentioned at the very beginning, like how 
I have been working with software now for 30 years has always influenced uh, it's, my, it's always part of like how how I design or think about design so it's like it's kind of saying yeah it, uh, how does that or change that the design you go with the possibilities you have and I rather see it positively and I was saying yeah there's so much more that you could do uh, um, and and that's maybe all implicit if you know what software can do how how that then changes changes des the design um but yeah i think it in that sense that you that you could consider to use data that you otherwise wouldn't have considered or that you then say well in 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 the because what well, sometimes people have for example they have an interview and they have people done drawings, but of course that was already part of the design. But then they don't think it to put it into the software and say, well, yeah, you can have that, you know, make a photo of their drawing and put it in the software, and then you can wonderfully hyperlink it uh, between your transcript and and the and the drawing people have done. So they have been thinking about, yeah, I let people draw something during the interview, but um, so that was part of the research design. But then they don't think about the how they can use that in analysis. And, and, and Susan, I would like to add also, if I may, uh, yeah, sure. that uh, the fact that with Atlas TI we can incorporate the geographic dimension, really that opens the possibilities. And what I normally say when, when I'm teaching is, is that many times we don't even consider the possibility when writing our designs um, that uh, we we are going to take a look at the geographic dimension, uh, but but if we have an interview in which the person makes reference to a given location, for example, uh, receiving services at a given hospital, well, since in Atlas TI we can add the geographic representation of that, that could in itself provide us new opportunities for new insights. So even though that was not considered when writing the design, uh, uh, we should be open to the possibility. So that really presents a point that maybe we should also add that to our design. Yeah, but that 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 really, you know, that if you know the possibilities of the software, yeah, and that's why that's what I'm saying. I know it. So of course that that that's always an integral integral part of what i think i i can do because i know the functionality and 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 the possibilities of the program and that that might sometimes limit people if they don't know it yet or they only know a little bit but then i say well this every study you learn and and you have to start somewhere and then maybe with the next study you know about that possibility and then it does come right away you know it goes into your research design from the very beginning um yeah, and then the the other um, recommendation is always is do your literature review. Yeah, because then you already learned the software and about the functionality, and maybe read a bit right and left. You do a literature review. You, well, you can also use geodata because there might be also some real geo reference there. But you know, if you explore software at that uh, phase already, that helps you also to get ideas for your own research design. Yeah, what you can do. Okay, thank you, Susanna. And, and, and it seems that we um, have come to the end of our presentation. So uh, I would like to uh, to ask uh, uh, Juliana to say a few words uh, before we close. And also, uh, after she speaks, maybe Susanna, you would like to uh, to say uh, goodbye. So, uh, 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 Juliana, would you go ahead? Thank you so much, Dr. Frise and Ricardo, for all of this fantastic presentation. I'd like to mention that we have another webinar coming up on April 27th or 22nd, pardon me, with Peng Fei Zhao on the impossibility of equivalence, critical theory, and translation in qualitative research. This is part of our Insights series in collaboration with Atlas TI. I'd also like to mention that we have Thinking Qualitatively 2021 coming up as a virtual conference from July 5th through 9th. Abstract deadline is coming fast. It's April 15th. 
multiple opportunities for Atlas TI uh, trainings, uh, including some sessions in Spanish, uh, and an amazing lineup of keynote speakers across the world. We've got North America, Latin America on July 5th, Scandinavia highlighted on the 6th, as well as UK and Ireland, Continental Europe and Africa, Middle East on July 7th. Australia, New Zealand, and Asia on July 8th, and software training on July 9th. So something for everyone throughout TQ, and we look forward to seeing people online in July. Thanks again, both of you. Thank you very much, uh, 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 Juliana. Uh, everybody, please uh, go back to the website where you register for this session because uh, new sessions will be posted there. Uh, so thank you very much, everybody, for coming today, and we look forward to seeing you again. Susanne, would you like to say a few uh, uh, closing uh, remarks? Yeah, thank you for being here and uh, listening to the presentation. I hope you enjoyed it. And I just see, I just want to say, we see a few questions that we haven't answered, but just to say that we will answer those questions um, as well afterwards. Yeah, Ricardo. It's yes. what yes. we do, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so just to see those people who have just posted some questions, we will get back to you as well. Okay. Yeah. Thank you then, Suzanne, and thank you, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you here again. Goodbye, everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye. Carlo, are you still there? Brigitte, are you still there?